You are one of the most important Vladimir Putin researchers in Russia. This Sunday, Putin will be re-elected the head of the state for the fifth time. Are you glad or sad about it? As an impartial observer, I shouldn't be either. However, I'm more sad than glad because I don't think there's going to be a new Putin. If the next incarnation is the same, I'm not interested. Are you tired of Putin? No, he changes. There are different versions of Putin. If you really watch him, he changes like everyone else. I've known him for 20 years. You said more than once that several different Putins have been ruling for the last 18 years. How many? I think there were maybe three and a half Putins. Let's name these periods. When was the first and what kind of Putin was that? The first Putin was an heir to the 90s. He came out of the 90s. He was the heir to Yeltsin with his crimson jackets and gold chains. He continued as a break on Yeltsin's reforms. Also, he had been trying to negotiate with the world on Yeltsin's terms until 2003. Until he realized that everything was a lie and a mess. After that, he started a return to his true nature, in which he felt comfortable. Putin is a Brezhnev officer. It's hard to explain to your audience what a Brezhnev officer is. We understand. It is a person who is surrounded by enemies, who has a few friends and allies over here, but there are always ancient enemies or tribal enemies to combat. That was Putin too. He is comfortable with this because it represents his education, his true beliefs, I think. He evolved to this during his second term with the Munich Declaration of War and the invasion of Georgia, because it's all about the Soviet Union. He was like this even during Medvedev Intermezzo. Finally, the third Putin is a reactionary, Putin the Restorer. This is the person who understood, in my opinion, that everything done for the last 20 years was wrong. The right path was the one before perestroika, before the transformation, before the fall of the Soviet Union. It requires rebuilding the empire. It's justified. It's better for everyone because when there are two empires, the United States and Soviet Union, standing on two legs, the world is more stable. We need to build the empire. Come to terms with the U.S. You are an excellent forecaster. If I'm right, you predicted the war in the Donbass, the annexation of Crimea, even more you predicted the presidency of Medvedev, when it was unclear who would come after Putin. What percent will Putin get in the March 2018 election? I guess it will be about two-thirds, 66 percent of the voters. It was 76 percent. It doesn't matter to him. That's the point. I think voting results in Crimea really mattered to him. Not Moscow, not Petersburg, not Lipetsk, not Grozny, God forgive me. The Crimea, because the Crimea massively approves him, that's the real referendum. He can say, just a second, I return Crimea to the empire. Look, Crimean people voted for the second time, four years later, 75, 80, 85 percent for reunification. I think Crimea is a fundamental story for him, not Moscow or Petersburg. Crimea. What should we expect in the next six years? If everything goes as it's going, I think we will be more isolated. I think there'll be a law restricting the internet and the dissemination of information on the internet. I think the fifth column will turn into a fifth pile. We'll see people being jailed because of likes and reposts. Everything will be censored, I think. The external isolation will be extreme. I don't know, but I bet everything will be worse, not better. Putin will try to stay in power for life, won't he? I think he will for two reasons. The first is security. If I go, who will guarantee the safety of me and my family? In a broad sense of the phrase, and a narrow sense of the phrase. Who guaranteed it to Yeltsin? Vladimir Vladimirovich. 
But if this was the only factor, you could overcome it. The second factor appeared after Crimea. I'd never heard Putin talking about his mission seriously before the Crimea. I have to accomplish something. He spoke about it. He asked me, what is your opinion? What will be written in the history books about the first two years? In 2008, we were sitting with him after the Georgian War. He said, what do you think, history teacher? Where were you sitting? In Sochi. There was an editorial board and then he called for me. We were sitting, talking about Georgia a lot. Did he only ask for you? Yes. We were sitting and talking about Georgia a lot and he asked what I thought. He was already the PM for two terms, but the sum is unclear. What will be in the school textbooks? I told him, you know, Vladimir, they'll be talking about your attempt to reunite the white and red churches. He said, that's all? Don't they write that Russia got off its knees? Don't they? That was 2008. But after the Crimea, that would obviously appear in the school books. This was a mission of restoration, the reunification of the Russian Empire, the Russian world, the USSR too, no matter what. That mission isn't finished. Until it is, he will not leave. It will never be finished, because such missions have no end. How long can we stay in Syria or Africa? Where will it stop? Canada? How far can we extend the Russian world? New York? I think his obsession with security and this Soviet Union restoration will not allow him to leave. So you can see the Crimea was invaded only to get Putin in a textbook. I think this is one result. That's not really true, because the idea appeared in 2008, and plans were prepared as the general staff is supposed to do. When Yanukovych was overthrown in Kiev during Maidan, Putin believed he had to move. If Yanukovych had stayed, Crimea would have probably stayed Ukrainian. But the takeover was triggered. It happened so felicitously, almost without a single shot. Well, several shots, I guess. They gave away their land, the Soviet Union, and took back their land. Of course, that will appear in the school textbooks five to seven years from now. That wasn't Putin's only motivation. It wasn't his motivation at all. His main motivation was the possibility. Maidan succeeded there. So we took Crimea, and we won decisively. He is a player. What could we gain after the pro-Russian authority called crumbled in Kiev? Crimea. So he conquered it. After 18 years in power, Putin is going to push it much further. But does he need to? Why can't he be in a normal state? No flashing lights, no billionaire buddies. Without pet deputies, who would be instantly swept out of the state Duma because of their lies. What's stopping them? The next phase of the mission. I think you, I, and Putin understand the word normal in different ways. For example, once he explained why having a majority in the state Duma is so important. There is the right decision, and it just passes quickly. Great. Everything else is petty, meaningless. If they raise something there, with great alarm, Putin thinks, we have USA on the one side, China on the other. There are 500 million in the EU. India has stopped buying our military systems, and you are complaining about flashing lights? What are you talking about? Talk to the chief of police. Why are you asking me that? This is a man preoccupied by geopolitical and geostrategic projects. There is a rocket somewhere in Florida. Don't people matter? Why? We do it all for the people. For their happiness. You had been a school teacher for 20 years. How could you stand being a teacher in a Soviet school in a country where you couldn't call a spade a spade? Disgusting. When I met some of my old students, I told them, sorry. First, because I didn't know a lot about the propaganda. Second, I hid some things from them. They forgave me. 
Was there some important lesson that you had to hide from them? Had to suppress some facts? I no longer knew what I was hiding. In the 80s, when there was Brezhnev and then Andropov, I was being antique books from revolutionary times and showing them and explaining everything. Not the whole truth, but I told the truth about Stalin and Lenin, more than others did. Were you ashamed of it? I was ashamed when kids, kids don't care, and the kids who were 16, 17 year old asked, what about the gulag? What is the gulag, I asked. The gulag? Haven't you read Alexander Solzhenitsyn? No, I haven't. And this little child, we'll give you the book. Everybody knew Solzhenitsyn, a child, a 16-year-old brought it to me, and I'd read it in horror. Were you forgiven? I was forgiven because I said I hadn't known. They were good kids. Kids are kinder than adults. When was the moment, if so, when we used the oil windfall to recover? I mean, not for show, but to make Russia much better, stronger. I think in the second of Putin's terms, 2004 to 2008, but already he had started to change. First, there was a Yukos affair, but we can say that there were such losses in, in the way. There were forced losses to build, to drill, to restrict people from exploiting the country. Perhaps in 2004 or 5 or 6, we could have invested in development with the oil riches. He realized by that time that deference to the West wasn't helping, that they would only lie, cheat, disappoint. Their intention was to control and hurt Russia. The color revolutions began. Here we come. Ukraine and Kyrgyzstan. Yes, that's why there's no trust, no relations, no common market. That's why we should tell the West off. Putin did that in 2007 in the Minsk speech. I was at the famous Munich speech when he raged at their disrespectful treatment of Russia. He did that as a surprise change of course, just to stun the Western audience. It was shocking. I saw the glowing, luminous faces of our delegation and was completely perplexed. After that, I realized in February 2007 that the Georgian war was coming. In what form, I wasn't sure. Why Georgia? It had the highest tensions with Russia. Shashkashvili made Putin furious, constantly insulted him. It was so predictable. I didn't assume, I just waited. You can't use the oil windfall for life. No one will need oil in 10 years. That'll be enough for us. That'll be enough for us? For us, I mean, for Vladimir Putin. What about me? That's your problem. Really? Yes. What about those guys, those guys that run the country, who have children my age and grandchildren? It won't be enough for them. They can figure it out for themselves. Is that what you think? Yep. Don't they think about ending this addiction? I don't know what they think, who actually really cares about it. Is Putin a hostage to the environment, or is he making all the decisions himself? No, if it's in the news, then he is. For example, in the Crimea, not many people told him, cool, man, cool, daddy-o. Wait, there are doubts? No, some people said, you are right, but there'll be consequences. His quoted answer, I made the political decision, and you should minimize any losses. Of course, he makes the decision. Of course, you can manipulate him, especially when he doesn't see some of the information flow. Like the internet. He doesn't like it, watch it, trust it. He says, Lyosha, 
Your internet is my internet. There's disinformation and manipulation. When was that? It was 2012, six years ago, as he was re-elected the third time. Do you think it makes sense for someone who rules a major country in the 21st century? In fact, he's right. There is a lot of disinformation and manipulation. Look at Trump. He's on the social networks. We can see him making decisions by tweet. It is out of date anyway. Right, but we have to get through it. We came through the 20th century. There was nothing before. People used to get newspaper information first. Once I was told when I came around with some news, wait, I have different info in my folder. You read the folders, don't you? Every folder was signed. I'll bust you if it's wrong. That was a sensibility. What irresponsibility. Here, in the prepared folders, is the truth. Newspapers and magazines had the truth, the responsibility for telling the whole story. There's that pressure even on TV. You can see it in News Anchor. And here there's NN1247Z reporting that Aleppo is being bombed. Is anybody responsible for these folders? I mean, the folders lying on Putin's desk. Who is the boss and the lord? Putin? No, who is responsible? Different agencies have folders of different colors. If you take a look at photos of the president's desk, you see that they have different colors. This is the FSBs, the SVRs, the Security Council, the central banks, etc. I think any leader is trying to find something to make them happy. Many are trying to guess what he wants and deliver that info to please dad. Dad? 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 Is he like Don Corleone? Well, like the dad. Who is more powerful in the state, Putin or Sechin? <laughs> uh, if Sechin was sent to Zambia as ambassador tomorrow, you would forget all about him. Of course, Putin is. Is that possible? Sure, Vladimir Kunin was really powerful, the head of Russian railways. He claimed the post of premier, which was discussed. They tried to remove him twice, Putin's entourage. Putin kept him. Then suddenly, bang, where is Vladimir? He's the KGB resident in New York, completely on his own. Where? Sergei Ivanov, the head of the presidential administration, the second most powerful person in the country. On the left is one phone, on the right is the other. Here's the prosecutor general, here's the head of the FSB. It's easy to call anyone. The head of the administration can do it. It was just the environment. It was Yukunin's wish, they said. But once, he claimed Medvedev's position. Does Sechin have presidential ambitions? I don't think he has them now. I think he has had them. I think that the main question in this election is the battle for premier. The applicants are Sechin, uh, Kutrin. Are you talking about the ones who want it or the ones who can win it? Who can win? What do you think? We're coming back to stories about security. It's about the second in command. If something happens to the president, even temporarily, the second one replaces him. There was a story about Boris Yeltsin when he went into surgery. I'm seeing a scalpel now. Yes, a heart operation. According to the protocol, the so-called nuclear briefcase, football, was handed over to Prime Minister Viktor Chernomyrdin. The doctor told me. When Yeltsin came to his senses after anesthesia, he said, where's the suitcase? You see, it's not just a symbol of power. I would rank Medvedev up there. He is still Putin's closest confidant. He didn't go off the reservation during those four years that he was president. Didn't betray Papa. He returned the suitcase, but he could have claimed it. There were people like Surkov, Prychodko, who pushed him to try for a second term. Dmitry, why won't you? Come on! No? He returned it immediately. It was hard, but he did it. Can such a pliable person protect Putin? Loyalty is not always a sign of strength. And perhaps, to fit in, we follow Putin's thoughts, but we are not in his head. 
I think it could be Medvedev, maybe Sobyanin, possibly Sergei Narishkin, now the head of the SVR. I don't think it could be Soigu. Although who knows what the president thinks. If he hires you, you obey like a good dog. Me? Yes. I wouldn't do it. No one will ask. They'll come, take you, and make you prime minister. God forbid. It is God, not Putin. You're just a little confused. Your grandfather was a star of the NKVD. <laughs> yeah, a star. Uh, he was a member of the military tribunal, went through the war. He was a member of the military tribunal of the second Ukrainian front. That's true. How do you see that now? I don't have any particular attitude. I don't know whom he had convicted, if he did it unfairly. I'm ready to apologize for a grandfather who's gone, to the descendants of those people whom he condemned wrongly. Isn't it possible to find out? Weren't you interested in finding out? No, I'm afraid. You're scared? I'm afraid to know. I would have to apologize to a lot of people. I'm an arrogant man. I don't like to apologize. Does Putin have doubles? I think, yeah, but I don't know for sure. Have you ever had doubts that it was really him? No, when he meets with editors-in-chiefs or journalists, I was sure it was him, because of certain elements in the conversation, his intonation. It interested me in 2006, when the first rumors started. You know, it's clear when you shake his hand. Of course, you never know. Anything is possible. I mean, when they turn on a streaming video with a report of some meeting. I don't think about it. I don't think Putin would trust any doubles. What is this parade of actors who appear along the edges of the, for the crowd scene? What do you mean? I mean those people in the crowd. When Putin comes around, there are people who greet him and tell him their problems. We know that often they're the same people in different regions. It happens. I saw the photos. I blame it on bad PR management. Because every region actually has a lot of people who I understand love. No, that's wrong. Support? You mean that? Yeah, they trust, they support, love because retaking Crimea engendered that. The Crimea didn't provoke votes, but a sincere thank you, because it was a dream and you made it come true. We didn't even hope to dream, but there was yearnings for the greatness of the Roman Empire. You have realized this dream. This is love. People love him because of that. We saw him hugging him. That surprised me. Perhaps there was an order to his security after the Crimean invasion. They always stand between him and the public. It's the Federal Protective Service. That's their job, preventing physical contact. But they moved away, and people rushed to touch him. He made a dream come true. He saw it, and I thought, gosh, how can the guards allow that? How do they feel? Maybe they love him, too. It's their job. There's a popular idea in Russia. If not Putin, who? Is it false? It is wrong because in the first two weeks of Putin's appointment as prime minister, no one even remembered him. Anyway, we're talking about the year 2018. Who will it be? Who? If not Yeltsin, then who? If not Gorbachev, then who? The 90s. It's such a patriarchal political system, when there was no electorate but a dynasty. Let him decide. If not me, then who? That's our political system. Voters think, let him decide. He put forward Medvedev, then Ivanov, then you. Putin knows what's better. The PM doesn't even know. Only Putin. That's fine. Sometimes there are revolutions. General Secretary Gorbachev. If not Putin, then who? That's the question. Navalny, here you go. Sobchak, great. What about Grudinin, Suryakin, Zhirinovsky? Did I forget anyone? Offend anyone? The final one. There is a feeling that Putin operates worrying about, worrying about how people think of him in a hundred years. Not what they think of him now.
I would agree. If you ask me, I think that Vladimir Putin thinks about his historical role in the textbooks. And what about us? You're adults. You'll figure it out. Who do you think are the three or four most powerful advisors to Putin now? I think the most powerful Putin advisor is Nikolai Patrushev, the head of the Security Council. No, he's the secretary of the SCRF. Putin is the head of it. I think his opinions on security and foreign policy are very important to the president. Perhaps this head of the central bank, Elvira Nabiolina. She's one of his main economic advisors, at least in finance. I think she should be taken seriously. Until recently, one of the main advisors on economics had been Alexei Ulyokhayev. Well, he's in jail now. I think that Igor Sechin is still very close to the president, especially about energy. Dmitry mm -hmm. Medvedev can't be discounted either. You're mentioning Medvedev for the second time. Don't you think he seems like an outsider in this influential group? Maybe they haven't turned on him because of Putin's faith in him. Exactly. He is immune only because of Putin's attitude. He says, I won't give him up. He's useful and I need him. It's not important. You said because of Putin's attitude, opposition. You're right. To his retinue's annoyance, Putin retains Medvedev as his most influential advisor. Do you know what he appreciates in him? Qualities we don't even suspect. One of the last issues of the dilettante is dedicated to Alexander III. Oh yes, that's a funny story. The story on Alexander III is about your conversation with Putin, isn't it? Of course, it even called Putin the producer, a co-author of that issue. That was the truth. We had already created that issue of the dilettante, dedicated to young Peter the Great and his reforms. The bloody tyrant Vladimir had never dreamed of the ramifications. We had finished it, and then Vladimir Vladimirovich gave a speech at the opening of the monument to Alexander III. Entirely lies. Everything was historically untrue. Everything. I don't know who wrote it. Medinsky? I don't know. Nikita Mikhailkov? Kirug? Maybe. Uh, well, someone who had studied a little history. We understood that it was a symbol of the regime's dishonesty. And I said, so, let's rewrite everything. Everything had already been done. The writing, pictures, signed for, we paid for illustrations. Damn, I said, make a new issue. So we created that issue in two weeks, maybe ten days, and sent it to Vladimir through Dima Peskov. And fittingly, we distributed it like this. There was a real Alexander III, but of course, the co-author is Putin. He just changed our magazine. Maybe if he says something else incredible, we'll do it again. Are they alike? Who? You understand, Alexander III is a myth to Putin. Anyways, I think Putin makes the same mistakes as the emperor did. Five years ago, we said he was like Nicholas I. And before that, he had been like Catherine the Great. I think now he emulates Alexander III. The giant strides which caused a revolution. The results of Alexander III's policy were the February and the October revolutions. The funniest point here is that everybody repeats that idiotic phrase attributed to Alexander III, that the only allies of Russia are the army and navy. Didn't he say it? No, those are the claims of his nephews. Even if he did, who actually betrayed Nicholas II? Who insisted on the abdication, the collapse of the monarchy? The army and navy. Those are your great allies. Nostrovia. Вот приезжает Владимир Путин куда-нибудь 
Imagine Vladimir Putin arriving in Western Europe or the USA. There's a press conference with a journalist, some kind of meeting, and somebody says, Vladimir Putin, there's no freedom of speech or action in your country. You are a tyrant. He says, what do you mean? There is the echo of Moscow. They attack me and all my people. Alexei, stand up, please. Don't you do that? You say, of course we do. That's why I'm really needed at the Echo of Moscow. Ask Putin about that. How true is that? When I talk about why the Echo of Moscow is still here, one of the reasons is for show. You just described the sham display, but there's another angle to the story. I know for sure that he learns certain news from us. This doesn't mean that he always listens to us, but sometimes he does. Brings us along, reads us. We are an alternative for him. Not just for him, we only do one program for everyone. It's an alternative source of information, where he sometimes says, they tell me, did you know this? Echo talks about this, and you've never heard of it? They don't lie. Why didn't you tell me? We are still an element of his informational portrait of the world. A tiny element, but still there. Like the story of the Pskov paratroopers, who died in Ukraine. He learned about that from us. Were they buried with honors? Recognized as heroes? No, but at least they don't hide the graves anymore. That's important to the families. We are for the families. We had a conversation. I was talking about Afghanistan. I told everyone that I had students then when I was a teacher. One day, two graduates in coffins came back from Afghanistan. I said, sure, the war had been unfair. They had been sent there, but they were also recognized, which was wrong. If they were sent there, then high politics had nothing to do with it. That wasn't true. But now it's even worse. They buy the silence of the families, pay large pensions. What? I didn't know. That's a lot of money for people in the provinces. They won't return Vasya's body, but you need to raise the children, families said. Who can knock them? A widowed mother with three young girls will be taken care of and paid a scholarship. Vasya can't be returned. What difference does it make where he died? I spoke with those women. You can't say anything against them. They say, well, yes. Will you support our children? They gave us the opportunity for Olga to study for free. And how much has it cost us? Who can criticize them? The politics is mixed with understanding. Not just the politics, but the understanding of vast loss. I talk to my friends who have a lot of money and opportunities. Many of them say in the next six years, there'll be some bad shit going down. Maybe a revolution or something and there's nothing anybody can do to stop it. I naively object to this, saying they're wrong. If you can endure the first blows at home, then it'll be okay. What do you think about it? Everybody has some understanding of how fucked up the situation is. I mean the revolution, the blood, when some people will slaughter each other in Moscow for political reasons. I went through it in 1993, but I'm still here after 25 years. I didn't leave. If there's a revolution, I'll have to deal with it to take a position. Against it, for example, or with it, the revolution. Or like a penguin who hides his body in the cliffs, settle in and shut down. Well, 146 million citizens won't leave. This is our country. Why should we give it away to them? Who is them? The others. Just them. With Peskov? I think we would take the same side. Are you on the same side now? We aren't on any sides now. Aren't we? No, we aren't. In any case, I'm not.